I'm going to undertake something, uh, try to undertake quite, something quite extraordinary, which is to explain Ethereum and smart contracts in half an hour. Uh, who's familiar with Ethereum? Did we, we, run, and we ran through the basics of Ethereum today, did we? Or just the basics of blockchain? Did we run through the basics? Brilliant. Okay. So essentially, all of you probably learned that blockchain is a distributed ledger. It allows us to uh, transact in an, in an open and auditable manner. And, uh, and, and those ledgers are distributed all around the world. And what happened once Bitcoin, which started in 2009, began to get a lot of traction and people started to use it and get comfortable with the system, they, uh, they decided, well, why can't we, uh, if, we can, if we can do this with money, what else could we do on this ledger? Because at the moment, as you know, in our current financial system, um, the uh, uh, money exists in silos. So you've got money in a lot of different banks, you've got uh, transactions go between those banks and you nearly have to, you really have to go through like third party intermediaries to make it so that you can interact with that money in any fast way. So services like PayPal, uh, Stripe and other credit card services allow us, even MasterCard and Visa, they're like layer two solutions and they allow us to basically interact with the money in some meaningful way that makes sense for business. So if you're, for example, here with Block Conscious, if you bought a ticket, when you bought that ticket, a payment processor took that ticket and then sent it through a third party program and you got your ticket in return. And in the background, those banking transactions probably only just cleared if you bought them this week, but there's a series of trusted intermediaries that work on that. So when, uh, when Bitcoin really started to gain traction, the, the people at Ethereum said, well, why can't we begin to do other things? And so they came up with this system called Ethereum and what Ethereum really allows you to do is it's a, it's a virtually, it's a shared operating system essentially for the blockchain. So it's not just a ledger for transactions, but it's a ledger for other things. And so the way that they've, they've structured Ethereum allows you to have external accounts, which are very similar to the accounts you guys have been interacting with today. So the accounts you've been interacting with today are user controlled accounts. You can send and receive transactions and that's quite similar on Ethereum. But the big difference with Ethereum is you've also got this concept of contract accounts. And contract accounts aren't actually user controlled. They're a separate type of account which sit on the blockchain and these external accounts can send code to these contract accounts and get them to do things based on that code. So they're almost like little programs that sit on the blockchain. And the way Ethereum's structured uh, with using these states, it means that every single account on the blockchain has a number of uh, parameters that you can set for it. And if you program your contract accounts in a certain way, they can react to other transactions. So I'm going to explain how that process works and so why it's such a big deal. So the first thing to say about Ethereum is we do have these, these two concepts of, uh, of contract accounts and, uh, and external accounts. And so the, like I said, the, the external accounts, they're controlled by uh, the private keys, very similar to your, block, your Bitcoin accounts. And uh, they can send messages to other accounts and contracts. And these contract accounts, they must be made by external accounts. They can't start transactions, but they can react to other transactions. So this is a general graph here of the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum. So in the Bitcoin ledger, when you send a transaction, and, and you'll see this if you go on a, did, did, anyone, did we go through block explorers today? Did anyone, okay, so a block explorer is essentially where you can see what's actually happening on the ledger in real time. So if you Google uh, Bitcoin blockchain explorer, you'll actually be able to go onto a website and see all the transactions flooding in. And generally there's about oh, 3,000 transactions per block at the moment with Bitcoin and you'll see each and every one of those transactions and they'll come up like this. So it'll say the from address and the to address and it'll have the amount. That's how the Bitcoin ledger works. Very, very simple ledger. The Ethereum ledger works quite, uh, quite differently. Each account has its own address and then it has a balance but it also has other details. So for example, if you looked at a contract account here, you'd see that it has a balance of 43 uh, Ethereum here, but it also has entitlements to these contracts and it also has some tokens which sit on it as well. And, uh, and that's essentially how the, 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 the difference is. So each Ethereum account looks quite like that. And when you want to send a transaction to the Ethereum ledger, you're, you're just updating the states of the accounts. So this is, this is an example of a transaction here. You've got, uh, you've got one, uh, one state here of several different um, uh, accounts and then you've got a transaction which one account sends and you'll see here the, different, the, the, the details have been changed 
um, on some of these accounts. And, uh, and you'll see here, so here we've got from that account to that account, we've got a value which, which can just be a value in Ethereum, but we've, we're also sending data. So we're sending, for example, here we've got Charlie. He wasn't on this, uh, this contract account here beforehand, but because we've sent that data to this account now, now you can see that Charlie's there. So Ethereum, so Bitcoin works like a, like a record of transactions. That's how you keep track of the balance. Ethereum works like a record of states and each contract uh, has its own state and that state gets updated as time goes on. So there's, there's four general components to the way that Ethereum transactions work. Uh, like I said, we've got transactions and we've also got this concept of gas. Now what gas is, is it's like your transaction fee. So with Bitcoin, you'll, you'll send a Bitcoin transaction and it will generally just have a set fee that you pay to the network and, and you can fiddle around with that in your wallet a little bit, but you don't have too much control. Ethereum, the reason that they've brought in the concept of a, 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 this, this payment fee called gas is because very early on they realised that if we're going to have uh, not just a ledger, but almost like a shared operating system around the world, we need to be very careful about what people can do on this shared operating system. We need to make sure that when they send, uh, if, they, if they send transactions, they're only sending transactions that they need to send and they can't start spamming the network. So there's a concept that we run into quite a lot currently with their internet systems, which is called DDoS. And that's where a hacker can send thousands and thousands of bits of information to a server and try and overload that server and the server will crash. And you actually see a similar thing. That's, that's a, uh, a negative way, but you'll see a similar thing when you try and buy tickets to a, a festival sometimes. You'll go on the ticketing site and because you've got 300,000 people all trying to buy a ticket at the same time, the server will crash. And they said, we can't, if we're having a, hosting an open financial network, we can't have that happen. That doesn't happen on Bitcoin, so we can't let that happen on Ethereum. And they brought in this concept of gas. And gas is essentially about paying as much as you think you need to pay. And it's almost a bidding war to get your transactions through. So Ethereum can handle about 12 transactions per second. Uh, and if you want to get a transaction through on the Ethereum network, you need to set your amount of, the amount of gas that you want to pay to be able to send that transaction through. You can also send messages. So like you saw before, where we had the Charlie and the Alice values on those contracts, you can actually start to send data with your transactions as well to these accounts. And uh, like I said, the fees are related to gas. Now, I'm not going to dwell on gas too much, but it's important if you ever want to, to learn um, to develop with smart contracts or use them in any meaningful way that you do uh, understand a little bit about it. So here we've got some, uh, some really simple operations on a, um, on, that you can do on a network. So in a normal computer program, you might add, subtract, multiply, and find the, uh, the, uh, whether, whether one value is equal to another on that network, and that'd be quite simple. On the Ethereum network, it actually costs you. So to, to do an add, uh, to do an addition operation on Ethereum, it'll cost you three gas. And subtraction will cost you three gas. Multiplication will cost you five. And so if you're building a smart contract, um, you, need to, you, need to, you need to be quite conscious of that. So if you've sent a transaction to Ethereum and you've set your gas price there and your gas limit there, uh, if your limit's 10 but you need 14 gas, your transaction's not going to go through. Um, and, but if you set your limit to, uh, where are we here, 20, and you need 14 gas, your transaction will go through. And so you need to be very conscious when you begin working with Ethereum uh, because you've got these contract accounts and they run autonomously and you need to make sure that they've got enough gas. Otherwise the network's gonna say, you're not paying us enough to do the action and we don't wanna get spent. That's, that's, all quite, that's all quite complicated and I've got to admit, I'm still getting my head around it and I've worked with Ethereum for quite a long time now, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind and it's worth explaining because it makes, it'll make more sense once we come to smart contracts. We've talk, you guys have talked a lot about wallets today. There are different ways to interact with the Ethereum blockchain. MetaMask is the most popular way. Uh, you'll see uh, when, you, when you go into your browser that you can download a MetaMask extension to interact with the blockchain directly. <coughs> but there are other options. My EtherWallet's another popular one. And Ledger, which uh, I think we we're giving out Trezors as well, which is a similar thing. That there are all ways that you can manage your, uh, your accounts on Ethereum. 
Like I said before, Ethereum has a, uh, an operating system. It's called the EVM, which means the Ethereum Virtual Machine. And if you've ever worked with virtual machines on your computers, it's quite similar to that concept. It's essentially, it, you can kind of picture it like uh, everyone hosting a version of Windows on a, dis on a distributed network. Everyone is hosting this Ethereum virtual machine on their computers all over the world. And the way that you program with Ethereum is you've got this uh, language called Solidity, which we won't go into, and there is another one called Viper. And they've essentially built these tailor-made languages to program these smart contracts. And what, what that allows people to do is it allows people to start to build applications on this Ethereum blockchain that can interact directly with the money. And these applications are called smart contracts. So that's a, that's a very, very brief um, introduction to Ethereum. And uh, I, I would encourage you in your own time to go back and actually look at some of this and find out a little bit more about how the network works. But without that brief, uh, without that brief summary, you can't really get a handle on what these smart contracts do. So smart contracts are essentially programs on a blockchain. And what they allow you to do is they allow you to say, OK, we've got money on the blockchain here. Can we manage that money in a way that's also trustless and immutable? So with Bitcoin, you've got an immutable ledger. Everyone can see the transactions going on. Well, what if we can engage with that money in a way that everyone can see, uh, see the way that we're engaging it? And we can know that if I, if I say to you, I want to go into business with you and I want to keep my records completely open, but I also want to have a little bit more power with what I do, that is where smart contracts come in. So they're programs which respond to messages and transactions that come on the network. And the key feature is that you can automate what they do. And uh, the, the real power of this is that uh, you can really reliably begin to transact with people on the network. And I always say that it's, it's, really a, uh, it's really a combination of money and business logic. So at the moment, like I was talking about before, you've got these silos of information all around the world. And you, your money is held in a silo with a bank, but your information is also held in a silo with a program somewhere. But if you can bring those two together and you can interact with it on the blockchain and you can say, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do, the, the, the example I normally give is a, a musician. Let's say you're a musician and, uh, and you have been dealing with a record company for 10 years or 15 years. And up until this point, you've had no visibility into those transactions. You get your check in the mail every month and the record company says, we're going to give you 30% uh, of whatever we sell and you'll just have to trust us that that's the, uh, that's the amount you're going to get. With Ethereum and with smart contracts, you could say to that record company, okay, that's great, but what I'd love to do with my new contract is I'd love to do it on the Ethereum blockchain. And I would love to, uh, what, I, what I would want to do is build a smart contract. And I'd love to have a contract account. And all, when all the money comes into that contract account, I want to build a program that can say 30% comes to my account and 70% goes to your account. And that's really easy to do with Ethereum because you've got money and business logic interacting on the same platform. So if you built a smart contract like that, you could see the, the, the funds coming in, just like you can see on a Bitcoin network, but then you could also see the funds going, going out. And the program would say, the moment the money comes in, 70% needs to go there, 30% needs to go there. And if you're the, the record company, there's not really anything you can do about that because you've deployed that contract and that contract's now immutable and everyone can see what's going on. The big, the, the big thing with that too is that you're not interacting with any banks. You're not interacting with any third party inter intermediaries. There's no APIs running in the background of that. That's raw at the coal face uh, relationship between money and business logic, which is, which is a real game changer. And so once you start to, to get a handle on that and you start to say, okay, so what you're saying is that we can, we can deal with our money directly and we can program how that, th those transactions behave. Uh, and we can program how those transactions behave whenever we want, then we can start talking about reliable automation. And we can start talking about reliable automation in a way that we've never talked about before, because that reliable automation is happening on an open platform. It's not happening in silos. And it's happening in a way that when, when parties come to the table and they say, this is what we want to do, those parties can interact in the open. They don't have to trust that those transactions are going on on someone's server. They don't have to trust. That, uh, that they're getting paid what they need to get paid. It can just happen. 
And the, the, the beauty of these smart contracts is that once they're deployed, oh, look, we're having, a, we're having an issue. Uh, right, so once they're deployed, uh, they're deployed for good. Unless you put a clause in there which allows you to change it or allows parties to vote to change something, those contracts are deployed on the blockchain and they will always behave a certain way. Now, people ask me sometimes, okay, well, they're called smart contracts. Are they legal contracts? And my answer is normally no. Uh, they're not really legal contracts. They are an agreement between parties if those parties say that's what they want to do, but there's no real legal element to them. There is a new concept called smart legal contracts, which is essentially incorporating the smart contract side with the English side and bringing them together. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in just a second. But the best way I say to picture these smart contracts, because it can be quite a hard concept to wrap your head around, is to picture them almost like someone who's on a watching brief. So you'll get people that'll come to, a, to a, a court proceeding, for example, and they might be for an independent third party or a journalist, and they'll be there just to watch and record what happens. And generally, that's what a smart contract is. It's like a watching brief on the blockchain. So you program this contract and you say, um, I want you to watch the blockchain, I want you to watch it for all sorts of transactions, and if this one thing happens, or if these several things happen, then I want you to do something. And that's generally how they work. So you could, uh, you could program a contract, and it could have one thing that it does, and it could do it really well, but it might never actually do anything. And it'll just sit there on the blockchain until such time as whatever it's watching for, or whatever transaction it's waiting for, actually occurs. Sometimes people say uh, there are similarities here to the current pro the way that programming is done, the current way we do things, and that's very true. So you can look at something like PayPal or something like Stripe and the way it allows you to, to host an event like this and, uh, and uh, do your transactions based on the money that people send to a certain company and send the ticket on from that. But the difference is, is that's, you don't really have any visibility into that process. And the parties in that process don't really have any, any visibility into whether what went on uh, actually occurred the way they thought it would. On, uh, when, when you're executing these transactions on the blockchain and when you're doing these contracts on the blockchain, you do have the ability to check it if you want. Now, you have to have the technological ability to check it, uh, but it's, it's, it's a market improvement over what we have currently with our API systems. I do a fair amount of work with... Uh, with Zapier, which is a, I'm not sure if anyone's used Zapier, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, take information from different sites and um, conduct further actions on them. So for example, you could look at something like Fox Sports. And if you've got your Fox Sports app, you can log in and you can see the scores from uh, of sport all over the world. Now, what Fox don't have, they don't have reporters everywhere all over the world reporting on, like directly entering these game scores into a, uh, into the network, they generally pull from other people's information. So ESPN might be covering a soccer match in Europe and they'll pull from that information there. And that's generally how they get the information. Um, but you, you're still relying on those third parties there. So the, a lot of this does go on, uh, but the difference with the, the, anything that's happening on the blockchain is you're interacting directly with what's already there on chain and you've got complete auditability in the, in the process. So some use cases for smart contracts is that uh, there, there's, there's several immediate impacts. I think one of the biggest ones is the changing role of the middleman. And what you'll notice in a lot of our society today is that we have a lot of transaction facilitators. And what that means is it, it's essentially people that have built a job out of uh, being third parties for trust or third parties for logistics. So for example, I'm from a farming background originally and when we sent produce to, to Brisbane, we would have an agent that would deal with the supermarkets for us. And the reason for that was log logistically it made sense because we would send our produce there and they'd, they'd put it in their fridges. And then uh, on a trust basis, it made sense as well because we could trust them that they would be able to on-sell our products to these supermarkets and to these shops that were coming to the, uh, to the, to the markets to buy produce. But the big issue we had is that uh, we would get a check in the mail every month and we wouldn't know whether that was actually the amount we were, we were entitled to. The, uh, the agents would take about 15%, that's what they'd tell us, but there was no dockets, there was no auditability into that process, there was nothing going on there um, to, uh, to, for us to have any kind of look into how much our products actually got sold for. But 
because logistically it made sense for us to engage those agents, uh, that, was, that was what we had to do. And you see that a lot around the, the financial world as well. So you see that with the record companies. You see that with a lot of these exchanges. So Binance, which we talked about earlier, is a perfect example of where there are transactions occurring and uh, it's, it's easier to trust them as a third party facilitator to facilitate those transactions and make things easy than to do it one on one. Because if we all wanted to trade one on one here in this room, it'd be very difficult uh, without anyone to facilitate that. But if you now go, there's, there's, there's a few interesting sites that are running on a technology called Zero X. And I'd recommend you just note it down and go have a look at it when you get the chance. They're, they're running what's called a decentralized exchange. And they actually have smart contracts programmed in the background which essentially handle the transactions in the open for you uh, and provide an interface to make that quite easy, but they never actually hold any of the funds, which is, which is the beauty of that. And that's a very direct application. We're seeing a lot of people using this in supply chains as well, because you're dealing with international products, you're dealing with a lot of information in different jurisdictions. And what people have noticed is that if we can have a shared ledger that's worldwide and we can have reliable execution on that ledger, it makes a lot more sense for me as, say, a shipping company who's visiting 20 different countries to say to every port, well, let's all just agree that we've got this ledger and the advantage of this is that we can see everything that goes on and all of our uh, transactions and agreements can be programmed out in the open and let's agree to use that. And so there's a lot of buzz at the moment around uh, uh, using these smart contracts for things such as supply chains. Financial systems is another one. Um, I've, I've got an example here which I just want to show you, which is, which is the, uh, the typical trust. So if anyone's, has anyone here ever dealt with a trust, been a, been a trustee or been a beneficiary? Okay, you'll know that the process is very, is, is, there's not much visibility into it at all. It's not very open. You'll generally have a trustee who manages the trust. It's their responsibility to do all the accounts. It's their responsibility to report on it. And this is a, this is a typical arrangement here. So, a company might pay money to the trustee and the trustee has to act as part of the trust deed. But this trustee, this trust deed here doesn't have any active enforcement over what the trustee does. It's just his guidelines, essentially. And if the trustee does the wrong thing, the only thing the beneficiaries can really do to, get, to, to, to make sure that they can get back at the trustee and get what they should have is to commence legal proceedings against him or at least, uh, at least send a nasty letter and try and scare him into doing the right thing. There's, uh, there's also limited visibility into the process, so the trustee does have an obligation to report every year on what goes on, but again, uh, the trustee is the one doing the reporting. And so if you're a beneficiary, there's, there, there's not much that you can, you can't actually gauge whether that's correct or not. But if you set up what, what I call a smart contract trust, it's a similar principle and it still works exactly the same way as it works now in theory, in that the company would pay profits to a trust but, uh, but the trust would be a, the trust contract account. So here we've got a little trust contract account, we've got a balance, and what it's saying here is that every time you receive a payment, pay each beneficiary 20%, and it's on the Ethereum blockchain, obviously. And so what happens is the money comes in and automatically the contract gets it and says, well, this is what my programming says to do, so I'm gonna pay it directly to the beneficiaries. The trustee, because he'll still have auditability requirements and he'll still need to report, can see what goes on but he can't change the fact that uh, these beneficiaries are gonna get what they get. And so there's no scope there for him to actually do the wrong thing. And so you can actually, you can actually say that, well, the trust deed is an active trust deed because it prevents the trustee from doing the wrong thing. It gives more visibility to everyone. The beneficiaries are happy, but most trustees are probably happy because, uh, because they can see all the transactions that are going on and all they need to do is record it. They don't need to spend all their time administering it, but there's no room for doubt there because it operates on that same principle of openness. Uh, and that's just, uh, that's just one small example of how the principle can be applied to, to many, many different situations. One of the big issues, so I, I just want to cover a couple of challenges really quick with smart contracts. One of the biggest issues with smart contracts is that, uh, is that of trust. Because we're talking about an open, uh, distributed system, you need to be able to trust the information that's on it because a lot of money can be at stake. And uh, there's been a big talk around how do we get information from outside in the internet onto, the, onto the, the blockchain so that smart contracts can act on it. There's a couple of solutions. People have talked about uh, private oracles, which is essentially saying in that Fox Sports instance, for example, 
Uh, we trust ESPN because they always give us good stats. So we're going to build our contract just to trust them. That's a private oracle which can report stats to the blockchain or whatever information you want. Uh, but there's also a public process called, uh, and I've seen one project doing it called Witnet, and they're essentially saying, let's apply blockchain principles to it and let's incentivize these, uh, these people to provide the right information and we'll give them monetary incentives and if they do the wrong thing, then the network can kick them off. Um, there's a few limitations. I, I, I'll put them up there, but look, it's, it's really worth exploring this in your own time as to the limitation of, limitations of Ethereum. And this smart contract principle isn't just limited to the Ethereum platform. So Ethereum was kind of the first one, and I like to say it was a really good test demo. And a lot of those, those gas issues, which I discussed earlier, uh, some of the reasons why it may not make really good commercial sense to continue on with it. But this, this concept of smart code on the blockchain uh, is something that is really powerful and a lot of other platforms are, are beginning to build better solutions. So uh, a couple that I'd recommend having a look at, uh, there's one called Cardano, which is in development, another one called EOS, which is just launched. Um, and uh, there's several others out there, there's some private solutions as well. Excuse me, but, um, but, the, but the big thing to say is that uh, it, it, there, there is really a, a, a massive use case here for taking our, audit, our, our open, our auditable, our trustless system, which is blockchain, which everyone's learnt about today, and then beginning to perform business logic on it and beginning to ed execute things on it. Um, that's, uh, that's about all I've, all I've probably got time for today. Uh, I've, I've really tried to condense a lot of information in there, so I understand that uh, some of it may not make sense. I'd encourage you to do your own research. I'm going to be around for the next, uh, this afternoon and then the next couple of days as well. So please feel free to come up and talk to me. Uh, you can also uh, visit my website, um, blocksense.com.au there. We've got some more information up there. The FOMO shows the podcast I run. We do some, we, we generally try and distill this and we generally have a bit more time to distill these principles. So feel free to listen to that as well. And uh, yeah, come say good day. Cool. Thank you, thank you, Matthew.